thanks very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, what has become known as the Great Divergence Debate about why modern economic growth began in Northwestern Europe rather than in relatively prosperous parts of China, or for that matter, Japan or India, is a very old one. But it began to take a new turn about 20 years ago when various people, myself included, began making a case that the decisive events had happened considerably later than the conventional use, wisdom used to claim, probably sometime between 1750 and 1800, rather than many centuries before that. I'll start tonight by outlining this revisionist position, arguing that the most advanced regions of China and Europe were surprisingly similar as late as 1750, which suggests that we need to rethink the large differences that were very apparent by 75 years later. And I do want to emphasize regions. Um, it is natural to assume these days that the unit of analysis for economic or other comparison should be the nation, because that's the form in which the data comes. But we have to remember that prior to the 20th century, that was by no means obvious. And we also have to remember to compare like with like. So China is larger than all of Europe. And just as Europe has its Britain and the Netherlands, and it also has its Balkans, so China has its Yangtze Delta, and it has places like Gansu. And when we compare something like England, the richest small little piece of Europe to all of China, we're bound to get a warped comparison. We want to compare like with like. So for the most part, I'll be talking about England or England and Holland in comparison with the Yangtze Delta, which is actually a sub even smaller. So this is a map of what a man named G. William Skinner called the eight macro regions of China. Within each macro region, the darkened area is the economic core. And so I will mostly be talking about the economic core of the lower Yangtze region. Anyway, I will outline the reasons why a lot of us now think that divergence came late and why we think it came. And then I want to talk about where the discussion has gone since the publication of The Great Divergence, which I think has largely confirmed the idea that divergence was late, though maybe not quite as late as I'd thought, and to complicate the new explanations of divergence that several of us had suggested. OK, now a brief review of the historiography. So in the 1960s, European economic historians began moving away from treating industrialization as a British-centered Big Bang, which had been the prevalent view up till then, reinserting it instead in long stories of slowly growing markets, slowly growing division of labor, many small innovations, and the gradual accumulation of small profits. And this gradual market-driven growth was surely crucial. But for those of us studying other areas, it became clear that that story didn't differentiate Europe from East Asia. Smithian dynamics worked there too, but they didn't transform basic possibilities. Eventually, highly developed areas everywhere faced resource constraints, in part because commercialization and what some scholars call proto-industrialization, the growth of handicraft industry um, for, produced for the market rather than for self-sufficiency, accelerated population growth. And most food, fuel, fiber, and building materials still came from the land. So every acre that was growing grain was an acre that was not providing wood or clothing fiber or whatever. Britain, I argue, needed for its escape not only the technology and institutions that Europeanists tend to emphasize, but coal, the Americas, and various favorable conjunction. And one of the ways that we can see that is if you, that if you look at places like Flanders and Holland, 
proto-industrialization led to results that looked much more like the Yangtze Delta or Japan's Kenai region than they did like England, which is to say they led to a highly developed commercialized agriculture, lots and lots of handicraft industry, highly sophisticated markets, but no industrial breakthrough, and over time, increasing population pressure that began to eat away at those earlier gains. If we think that way, then the Industrial Revolution once again becomes a discontinuity to be explained. Because it's just as easy to see Europe as a China that failed to happen, as the more common exercise of seeing China or Japan or whatever, or for that matter, Flanders, as an England that failed to happen. Now, in a powerful synthesis of the gradualist story that dominated the history of European growth from the 60s until very recently, a man named Jan de Vries at Berkeley has embedded the Industrial Revolution in a larger process he calls the Industrious Revolution. And he proposed that initially in order to resolve a paradox. And the paradox is this. The grain buying power of European day wages fell sharply from about 1430 to 1550 as population recovered after the plague. And then it didn't return to 1430 levels until well into the 19th century. So this particular graph gives you how many hours of labor were required to earn enough bread for a family of four in Strasbourg. Um, if you were to use other European cities, the graph would look somewhat the same. It would peak at a slightly different point. But the basic point is you, you see that it's under 50 hours in the 15th century. It doesn't get back to being under 50 hours until very late in the 19th century. Even in London, the richest part of Europe, it doesn't get back to 15th century levels until the early 19th century. So if you were to measure economic progress by grain deflated wages, they don't suggest much early economic progress. And grain deflated wages are not a bad way to think about the economy in this period because grain is a huge percentage of what most people consumed. But at the same time that this is going on, other measurements do suggest a significant amount of economic progress in Europe, at least in Northwestern Europe. Death inventories, for instance, lists of what people own at the time they die, show significant increases in people's possessions. Even very poor people owned a little bit more clothing, a little bit more furniture, so on and so forth, by, say, 1800 than they had 100 or 200 years before. So you might be wondering if it's taking you more hours per week just to put bread on the table, how is it that you're also winding up with more stuff? Well, this could occur partly because people spent more hours per week working for the market, generating the cash that bought some new possessions as well as stable amounts of their increasingly expensive bread. People probably had less leisure, though that becomes complicated and partly depends on how you define leisure. One thing that they definitely did is that they spent less time making goods for their own households, so that a family of, say, cloth makers stops also making its own candles. They put more hours of work per week into making the cloth and they buy their candles. In other words, they specialize more, and they buy other things, some of which save time on domestic chores, to use the modern parlance. And this is, of course, the essence of what Adam Smith said ought to happen, and what I've called Smithian growth. Interestingly, though, something quite similar is happening in China, and maybe elsewhere as well. Rice-deflated day wages mostly fall, with a couple of exceptions, from about 1100 on. But circa 1750, even after all that decline, earnings for farmers 
and for textile producers in the Yangtze Delta, still matched up well against England. Um, in a- agriculture, rough parity lasted into the 1820s. Um, so none of these um, numbers should be taken as gospel, but they give you a rough sense of comparability. So those are English numbers. Whoops, what happened to the Chinese numbers? Ooh, that's not good at all. I'm sorry. Trust me, the numbers are pretty comparable. Sorry about that. Rough nutritional parity is also suggested by Chinese life expectancies, which were close to England's and above most of the continents until almost 1800, and indirectly by birth rates. And I bring up birth rates here because we actually have better data on birth rates than on life expectancy. Contrary to mythology, Chinese birth rates in the early modern period were slightly lower than European ones, between about 1550 and 1850, while population grew a bit faster. And since emigration was not a significant factor in the Chinese case, if population, if the birth rates are no higher and the population growth is faster, the death rates have to be somewhat lower. And death rate, lower death rate is, of course, just another way of saying slightly higher life expectancy. But there is more to life than staying alive. And so perhaps even more interesting is the evidence of increased consumption and of non-essentials by ordinary Chinese between about 1500 and 1750. Unfortunately, we don't have the equivalent of European death inventories because inheritance doesn't work the same way in China institutionally. But we do have evidence from travelers' accounts, from elite complaints about popular consumption, and so on. And for those commodities where I could construct measurements, China circa 1750 stacked up reasonably well against Europe, and the Yangtze Delta, the richest area, stacked up pretty well against England. Uh, Here we have tea and sugar. Um, Tea is perhaps no great surprise. Where does the stuff come from after all? But the numbers on sugar were sufficiently surprising that I re-ran them about five times. I couldn't believe this was true. Um, here we have some material on cloth. And part of what's interesting, so ideally you'd like to get a market basket of everything people were consuming. And there's no way to get that. But if you're going to get just a couple of indicators, sugar and cloth are actually pretty good because most studies from development economists will tell you that when a poor economy starts growing, two of the first categories where you should start to see increased consumption are cloth and non-grain foods. So having sugar and having cloth is, is nice to have. But of course, these parallels didn't last. From 1750 to 1900 or so, production, consumption, and specialization all jumped forward in Western Europe, while in China, per capita non-grain consumption actually declines. 1900 figures for cloth and sugar, for instance, are below even my most conservative estimates for 1750. So what's going on? Much of the difference is ecological, but not in the sense that population pressure was producing more serious problems within Chinese cores than European ones. And I've made several attempts, and others have more recently, to construct various indices of ecological distress to see if China's large population is creating something like a Malthusian crisis. And the answer is pretty clearly that at least in the core areas, it wasn't. For one thing, had it been, life expectancy should have been going down. Um, We just saw that it wasn't. Um, I've made an attempt to reconstruct nitrogen fluxes from dry farming areas of North China and England, circa 1800, and they don't show more severe soil depletion in China. And if I threw in South China's paddy rice regions, the comparison would actually lopsidedly favor China. Even for deforestation, 
There's no clear Western European advantage circa 1750, despite its much sparser population. The Chinese used land and fuel very efficiently, and they were actually better off in some ways than Europe and declining less rapidly. Okay, that's more. I, so this is trends in forested area comparing the southeast coast of China, the provinces of Guangdong and Guangxi, with France, which is actually the best forested European country, Western European country in this period. And what you see is that forest cover is clearly declining. Um, Lingnan is just Guangdong and Guangxi together. So you see it's clearly going down as population goes up, but it's not any worse than France. And in fact, it's declining more slowly. Here's a slightly fictional, but I think useful, further step. So this is, imagine that every piece of forest growth every year was harvested, so that you kept the amount of forest stable and you just, you cut an amount of wood equal to how much had grown that year. How much fuel would you have per capita? And again, you see it's clearly going down in the Lingnan region, but it's holding up quite well against France, which again is relatively well forested for Europe. And this, well, the third thing I won't bother you with, it's even more speculative. What this adds up to is that a feature of Western Europe's 19th century breakthrough that is too little remarked on in the literature is that some important ecological variables were actually stabilizing in that period, despite unprecedented growth in both population and per capita consumption, while the much slower growth of the early modern period had actually produced serious and accelerating ecological strain. Archaeological evidence points to serious soil degradation in various parts of West and Central Europe, which confirms reports of generally stagnant or declining yields, though there were also areas, mostly right around cities, where yields were rising. Forests shrank dramatically, sandstorms became more common, and so on. So why does this much of this stabilize in the 19th century when you might expect more people consuming more stuff per person? Ecological degradation should get worse. One crucial factor is the switch in a few areas to subterranean energy sources, above all, English coal. And that is partly a story of technology, but there's also a lot of luck in this. And the luck becomes fairly clear when you put it in comparison with China. China has lots of coal, but the vast majority of it is in the north and northwest, especially the northwest, many, many landlocked miles away from the core regions where demand was, was strongest, too far to be economical before railways. Uh, basically, the price of fuel in the pre-modern world is the price of shipping it. And, it also, and the fact that most of the coal was so far from the economic core also meant that it was quite far from the concentrations of skilled artisans who were most likely to produce breakthroughs in how you mined and used it. Moreover, in 18th century Chinese coal mines, which were mostly in very dry areas, the big problem was sudden gas explosions, not, as in England, flooding. And it was pumping water out of mines, which created perfect conditions for refining a bulky initially very inefficient steam engine. Um, the early ones converted less than 1% of the energy they used to motion. And in 1800, 80% of all steam engines were at the pithead of mines. They were in the one place where fuel was virtually free, and therefore the incredible inefficiency of the early steam engines in burning it wasn't a problem. And that eventually created a market for a machine that once it was improved and got a bit more efficient, 
eventually transformed any number of processes. The Yangtze Delta, meanwhile, lacked all kinds of energy. No coal, no peat, very little timber, not even much water power since the area is flat. And it simply never developed much in the way of heavy industry. So that's one part of the story. A second part is that Western Europe benefited from soaring imports of land-intensive products, especially from the Americas. As demand for food, fiber, building materials, and fuel, which Malthus famously called the four necessities, all grew with population, core regions er everywhere, to one degree or another, had to acquire these land-intensive products by trading with a peripheral region that wanted the manufacturers, mostly textiles, that core regions produced. But that trade tended to run into one of two problems. In a place like Eastern Europe, West, which was Western Europe's periphery, with many barriers to factor mobility and many people outside the cash economy through institutions like serfdom, the response to external demand was actually rather sluggish. And indeed, the Baltic trade plateaued by 1650 at a fraction of the size of China's long-distance staple trades. But over the longer haul, the freer trade of advanced Chinese regions with their interior also hit limits, with hinterland families more or less free to allocate their own labor, the export boom and commercialization stimulated population growth in places like North China and the Middle Yangtze region during the 18th century. And as the best land in those regions filled up, some labor switched into handicrafts, reducing their surplus of raw materials because they were consuming more of it locally, and also reducing their demand for imported textiles. What had been by far the world's largest long-distance staple trade plateaued and then declined as the peripheral regions gained population and developed more handicrafts. Moreover, the terms of trade shifted sharply against manufacturers and against the Yangtze Delta. Right? So as these interior regions that used to have relatively few people and export tons of surplus rice and timber now come to have more people, some of whom are producing cloth, there's more competition for the rice and timber, right? So from the point of view of the Yangtze Delta downstream that used to import it, that stuff's getting more expensive. Meanwhile, the cloth that they used to ship upriver to pay for the rice and um, timber faces more competition because now these interior regions are producing more of it. The result is that the same pieces of cloth bought about half as much rice in 1840 as in 1750. And this constrained the development of the core regions. The population of the Yangtze Delta is virtually flat from 1750, and the share of labor in non-agriculture probably fell. Um, all Chinese population numbers should be taken with a considerable grain of salt, but here's a Here's a set, and what the basic pattern is that the richer the area, the slower the population growth, right? So the lower Yangtze, only 15%, while China as a whole is almost doubling. Jiangnan, which is the richest part of the lower Yangtze, pretty much flat, um, high growth in some of the frontier areas. This is also the reason I mentioned before that in 1900, consumption of things like sugar per capita in China is actually lower than in 1750. This is part of the explanation. It's not that any given place was necessarily getting that much poorer, right? But the richest place is coming to be a smaller and smaller percentage of the population, and so it has less weight in national averages. This, this is a graphic version of the same thing. 
So the darker the color, the faster population is growing. And as you can see, the richest areas of China are basically white. This produces an effect that works sort of like this. And don't worry, this is the only, only graph you're going to get. But that line that go, the curved line that goes down is the marginal physical productivity of agriculture. So how much additional crop do you get for your next minute of labor? And the reason it goes down is pretty simple when you think about it, right? Imagine that you have a piece of land and you only want to spend a few minutes on it. Well, you're going to go out, you're going to throw the seed down, and you're not going to come back till harvest time. Your yield per acre will be crummy, but your yield per labor hour is pretty terrific, right? As you put more and more labor into that same piece of land, each successive task that you go to is a little bit less productive than the one before until way down at the end, right? If you're still on that same piece of land and you're way, way out in number of hours worked, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be doing a 10th round of weeding. And the 10th round of weeding makes a very, very small contribution to output. So that's a normal situation in no way pathological or bizarre or distinctly Chinese. It's just the way the world is. Line P1 represents your marginal productivity at a loom, let's say, or at any handicraft. And it's basically flat. In your 10th hour, you produce about the same amount as you produced in your second hour, and so on ad infinitum. Consequently, at some point, the two lines cross. And assuming you're economically rational, starting at the point that they cross, you stop putting more labor into agriculture and you shift your labor into handicrafts. And then if your total amount of labor is L1, you get that much handicraft. Now what if the returns to your handicraft labor drop relative to agriculture, as I just said they did in the Yangtze Delta? Well, you're going to shift from P1 to P2, right? Returns are still flat per labor hour, but at a lower level. You're going to go much further down that agricultural curve before it starts to make sense to switch your time into, into cloth production. Consequently, either you're going to produce a heck of a lot less cloth, or to produce the same amount of cloth, you're going to have to work more. You're going to have to go out to L2. So this is a really simple, oversimplified, of course, account of what happens in the Yangtze Delta in the 19th century. And I like it partly because it is simple, but I like it even more because I stole it. Um, this graph originally comes from a book by a guy named Joel Mokir, who's describing what happens to industry in Belgium and Holland in the late 18th and 19th century. So you know, nothing, nothing pathological, nothing distinctly oriental, this is, if Mokir is to be trusted, what ought to happen as a handicraft and agricultural economy develops unless you get some sort of break that gets you out of this constrained world. And part of that break, I would argue, was coal. Another part was the Americas. Because I just described these two situations in which you have a core region trading with a resource-rich periphery. And in both cases, I described how the trade eventually stagnates. The Americas were rather different. Smallpox and various other catastrophes depopulated the region. And much of the labor force was replaced by slaves, slaves who are purchased from abroad. Moreover. New World slaves engage in less subsistence production than most coerced cash crop workers in the Old World did. And thus, despite their poverty, they actually make up a significant market for things like coarse cloth. Right? They do have to be clothed. Between the costs of buying the slaves themselves and the costs of providing them with certain necessities, the slave world has a big import bill to pay for and consequently needs to export. 
And thus, the circum-Caribbean slave region, from Brazil to what becomes the U.S. South, becomes, I would argue, the first periphery to look like a modern periphery, spending a lot on imported capital goods, in this case, human kidnapped capital goods, and a fair amount on mass consumer goods, paid for with continually growing land-intensive exports. While this is happening on one side of the world, the Yangtze Delta on the other is, as we've seen, running into problems with import substitution in at least some of its peripheries. Somewhat similarly, Japan's advanced Kenai and Kanto regions have no population growth from 1720 to about 1860, while various outer regions of Japan gained population, developed their own handicraft industries, and saw their rice surpluses shrink significantly. So East Asia's most advanced regions may have actually suffered from markets working very well, while factor endowments were not different enough among regions. This led to an increasing dispersion of proto-industry and a kind of ecological cul-de-sac, while Europe reaped benefits from limits on markets and import substitution bound labor, colonial monopolies, and other things that kept resource exporting regions, resource exporting regions. So what at least I hope we achieved in the sort of first round of the great divergence debate was that people like myself sort of normalize China's experience, suggesting the importance of relaxing land constraints both through mining and the New World, for British and later Northwest European growth. In other words, in other way, instead of what happened in Europe being what ought to happen, what is normal, and looking for, hey, what's the blockage in China? The argument becomes, hey, blockage at a certain level is normal. What we want to understand is why the freak of Europe not experiencing that blockage. And part of our argument is, hey, it was starting to experience that blockage, and then good fortune intervened. Even in 1830, before the great mid-century boom in North American grain, meat, and timber exports, and the tenfold increase in England's sugar consumption over the rest of the century, local substitutes for Britain's New World imports would have required about 23 million acres mostly to replace cotton imports. That figure exceeds even the 15 million acres of forest that um, Tony Wrigley estimated were rendered unnecessary by coal production circa 1815. It also exceeds Britain's total arable and pasture land put together. Without such new resources, ecological constraints might have hobbled English growth much as the filling up of the Chinese interior hobbled the Yangtze Delta. China's ecological problems became severe in the 19th century, not, however, primarily in the densely populated cores, but in areas like the overlogged Northwest and Southwest and the North China cotton country. There was also a sharp drop in the water table in the semi-arid North and West as their populations grew. By the late 1700s, we already have many reports that wells had to be redug. And over the next century, we see many lakes shrinking or simply disappearing. So the basic picture here is one of European and Chinese cores with much in common, but hitched to very different kinds of peripheries. Chinas are filling up, turning to handicrafts, hitting ecological constraints, and exporting fewer primary products. Europe's are vastly expanded, ecologically rich, and set up institutionally in ways that encourage a continued export orientation. So in this new picture, New World trade, shaped by smallpox, slavery, and various other peculiar conjunctures, was critical. Not because it was super profitable, as dependency models used to claim, but because it offered a special kind of trading partner, one which allowed European cores to change labor and capital into land-saving imports 
in a way that expanded trade closer to home couldn't, and in a way that the Yangtze Delta and Lingnan were finding it increasingly impossible to do. That's not, of course, all there was to the Great Divergence, but it's a part of the story that's generally been missed by people who were looking for origins much further back in time and who saw only one path to the modern world. Okay, so that's, that's sort of round one. How does it look almost 20 years later? Well, the claims that we revisionists made about agriculture have absolutely held up. Bob Allen, probably the leading living historian of British agriculture, found that Yangtze Delta agricultural labor productivity was still at roughly 90% of British levels as late as 1820, and land productivity was at 800% of British levels. So that's a pretty good combination. Incomes of farm families were almost exactly even. Li Bojong and Jan Leuten van Zanden making a comparison of two Yangtze Delta counties, which we have unusually good data. And the Netherlands found pretty much the same thing. And Yangtze Delta agricultural label productivity circa 1820 was interestingly way above that in many European countries that would industrialize over the next few decades. It's more than double France and, or roughly double France and more than double Germany's. So whatever else may the, be the issue be, agriculture isn't the problem. Similarly, the claims that we made about basic standards of living of the poor, as measured in things like calories consumed, life expectancy, etc., have also held up pretty well, suggesting that overpopulation, at least in a simple, straightforward way, is not the story either. Claims about GDP, which is actually a measure I chose not to use, but some other people did, is very difficult to measure in early modern economies. To the extent that new work does so, it shows a mixed picture. It now looks like England passed the Yang Yangtze Delta somewhere between 1700 and 1750, which is earlier than I had guessed but a lot later than many earlier models, and late enough, I think, to uphold the basic idea that the key difference can't be some eternal and fundamental difference, like a lack of any, any valid property rights in East Asia, or a lack of interest in innovation, or something like that. If it was anything that fundamental and broad, it would be pretty hard to explain why divergence comes so late. And unskilled, another thing though, that turns out to be interesting and that I'll get back to near the very end of my talk, is that one funny outlier is that unskilled real wages diverge much earlier than do other indicators of popular living standards. So our best estimates of how much poor people are consuming look very similar even into the very late 18th century. But if you just take day wage for people with no particular skills, divide by the grain price, or not by the grain price, but by the price of multiple necessities in life, in that, Britain and the Netherlands pull ahead much earlier. It seems weird, but there's an explanation that I'll get back to a little bit later. There, it's actually quite interesting. Given that, as I said, Chinese agriculture still compares well to Europe's, even in the early 18th century, and the Yangtze Deltas to Britain's, it's no great surprise that the divergence is entirely accounted for by the urban economy, by the fact that per capita incomes in Western European cities exceed those in the Western European countryside by much more than Chinese urban incomes exceed Chinese rural incomes and by the fact that by the 18th century, urban population is a larger percentage of total population in at least England and Holland than it is anywhere in China, including the Yangtze Delta. 
So we seem to be getting somewhere. What fuels this urban divergence? Certainly some of the story is technology, but in fact, prior to the 19th century, manufacturing plays a fairly small role. The big story in Britain and the Netherlands is the growth of services, especially linked to trade. Everything from financiers and insurance brokers to longshoremen and sailors, while the Chinese urban service sectors seem to stagnate. Indeed, the best evidence is that it's actually trade-based demand for labor that pulls Dutch and British workers out of the countryside, creating a shortage that eventually raises wages in the countryside and forces productivity-enhancing changes in Dutch and British agriculture, not, as we used to think, improvements in agriculture that made labor redundant and caused people to move to the cities. It's, it's the cities pulling, not the countryside pushing. And crucially, the, those interest, increases in agricultural productivity, when they eventually do come, do not go along with land productivity increases sufficient to keep up with population. If you think back to that, well, back to this, what's happening is not that you're moving all the way down the, the curve doing that 10th weeding. Right? Essentially, what's happening is you're going back up the curve as more demand in the cities sucks labor out of agriculture. And you're not actually getting very impressive growth in the amount of food you actually grow. Instead, food imports increase. And especially in Britain, land increasingly doesn't produce anything other than food. Clothing fiber increasingly comes from overseas, fuel from underground, and building supplies more and more from underground too, as, the, as there's a big shift from timber to stone. So we're back then to mining and the Americas, I'd argue. Not as the whole story, but as central parts of it. The impact of the former, of coal, is almost too obvious to state, at least for the British case. The question is more how you explain that coal. So science and technology clearly matter, though in the case of the steam engine, all the science that you needed for that was science that was understood in, in China as well. Um, and this therefore probably mattered less than the geographic luck that I explained earlier. And then there's overseas trade for which well, this may at first seem harder to imagine having the same kind of epic-making impact as a new power source and a machine that allowed for the first time to turn heat into motion, transforming any number of processes. But without that overseas trade, you couldn't have kept early industrial growth going. And history is full of earlier examples of spurts of growth that weren't sustained the way the boom of the last 200 years has been. To go back to this yet again, if you imagine that what you're doing is you're moving back up the curve, right, shifting out of agriculture and into industry, right, and you're not increasing your agricultural output much, then pretty soon you're going to choke off your growth unless you can get agricultural and other land intensive goods from somewhere else, right? Because everybody in your labor force does have to eat, does need clothes, so on and so forth. Confirmation of the enormous importance of transatlantic trade in particular, which is all the more striking to my mind because the methods used to get at this are so different from the ones I used, come from a study by Kevin O'Rourke and Jeffrey Williamson of the ratio between wages and rents in Britain. They argued in a paper published in 2006 that a sustained increase in this ratio is what marks a transition from a more or less Malthusian world in which population is always going to raise rents relative to wages. Right? That's not to say that wages can't rise. But if land is fixed, then as population rises, they would argue, 
rents are always going to go up faster than wages. To a modern world in which increases in labor productivity combined with finite demand for farm and forest pro products allow the wage rate to rent ratio to rise despite population growth. So O'Rourke and Williamson build a model in which foreign trade is irrelevant to relative prices. And they find that that model perfectly predicts the actual, generally worsening, ratio of British wages to land rents based on population trends from 1500 to 1730. In other words, if you know what's happening to population over those 200 plus years, then you know what's happening to the wage to rent ratio. And it's generally getting worse for labor. Beginning about 1730, though, and especially after 1800, the model becomes less accurate. The wage to rent ratio continues to worsen, but much more slowly than the model would predict. And then, for various reasons, they have crummy data from 1800 to 1840, which is a real nuisance, just when we want good data and they don't have it. But after 1840, the model becomes utterly useless. The wage to rent ratio rose by 394% between 1842 to 1936, when the population-driven model predicts that it should have fallen by 54%. So something started to happen in the 18th century and then happened in a big way in the mid-19th. The authors then use a series of regressions to assess two contributors to this turnaround. One, an unprecedented increase in, in labor productivity. And two, a much smaller increase in rents than the population-based model would predict because land-intensive imports soared. And so essentially, though it didn't look like it, you were more or less growing the land supply. Remarkably, what they find is that these two scenarios come out having equal statistical weight. In other words, O'Rourke and Williamson conclude that all the other productivity enhancing changes that we identify with modernity put together, right? Technological change, improved education, improved nutrition, changes in the legal system, you name it, all that put together did no more to divert England from a Malthusian path in the century after 1842 than the expansion of transatlantic trade alone did. If this picture of developments after 1842 has any validity, then it becomes hard to doubt that extra European trade was also crucial to the gradual drift away from Malthusian patterns during 1730 to 1842. After all, technological change was slower in that period and the weight of agriculture and forestry in the economy much greater. Now that still leaves questions about how irreplaceable those overseas resources were but it confirms that understanding how and why they became available is critical. And this leads us back to accidents of geography and epidemiology, but also to the ways in which state power was used in Britain in particular to consistently back certain kinds of economic expansion by making it possible to remove popular resistance to canal building at home to suppress opposition to new technologies, such as by the Luddites, and by not only ensuring access to overseas resources, but creating a partnership between the military fiscal apparatus and merchants, one which indirectly benefited industrialists too, though it was not until the 19th century that they were really able to join the ruling coalition themselves. Ironically then, China, had something closer to the night watchman minimalist state of many economists' dreams. And that was great for Smithian growth. But launching modern growth took quite a different kind of state, which, contrary to Smith's wishes, is what Britain, arguably the most heavily taxed country in the 18th and early 19th century world, had. It wasn't just that the Chinese state didn't force the rest of the empire to serve the growth of the Yangtze Delta Corps, 
instead promoting things like the diffusion of cotton textile production throughout the empire. Their fundamental idea of what political economy was supposed to achieve was different. And though we should not, of course, assume that what they did produced what happened, right? States are rarely that effective. It did help to produce a particular kind of relative pre-industrial prosperity that we can now see in retrospect worked against the likelihood of industrialization in certain ways. In the time that remains, let me focus on two. One involving inter-regional relations within China and clearly planned from above, and one involving urban-rural relations and having mostly emerged by happenstance from the bottom up. So first, the top-down story, which is the simpler one. The Yangtze Delta was by far the richest region in China. A good guess is that per capita incomes there averaged about 50 to 60 percent above the average for the empire as a whole. The rest of the southeast was also richer than average, though not by as wide a margin. Consequently, those areas also produced the largest number of people who passed the extremely competitive civil service exams and became government officials. And if you think with a modern mind, you might think, aha, if the officials come from those regions, they're going to promote policies that promote the interests of their regions. Doesn't work out that way. On the contrary, the Delta in particular paid by far the highest tax rates in the empire, perhaps as much as five times the average in some counties, while still being expected to pay for many of its own public goods, such as water control projects, while subsidizing state efforts to stabilize the ecologies of poor, fragile regions in the north. So this is extremely crude, but here's a precipitation map of China. I don't know how well you can see it, but the line that says 750, that's roughly 30 inches of rain a year. Below 30 inches, rain-fed agriculture gets dicey. The line that says 500 is roughly 20 inches of rain a year. Beyond that, rain-fed agriculture gets really, really dicey. Um, so most of the vulnerable areas are areas in the north. In particular, Lower Yangtze taxpayers paid most of the costs of providing the grain needed by Beijing so that the North China countryside didn't have to feed such a huge city, which it couldn't have done from its own surpluses. And Yangtze Valley taxpayers also paid almost all the costs of maintaining the Grand Canal, a thousand plus mile artificial waterway along which that grain was delivered to the north. Better yet, at least if you're a northerner, part of the cost of, con of maintaining the Grand Canal is the cost of controlling the Yellow River, which crosses it at more or less right angles in North China and thus had to be controlled if the canal was to function. So North China peasants get flood control not because the state is composed of such wonderful folks who want to give them flood control necessarily, but because if they don't control the Yellow River, it blocks the Grand Canal. If they, don't block, if they block the Grand Canal, Beijing doesn't get its grain from the south. The members of the garrison get irritable and no state likes that. The Delta also paid for much of the costs of a sophisticated emergency granary system, which mostly benefited the poorer, drought-prone North and Northwest, and various other efforts to stabilize subsistence in China's poorer regions. Now, none of this was on a scale comparable to a modern welfare state. I mean, let's not get carried away. But by 18th century standards, it was extensive, expensive, and reasonably effective in minimizing disaster mortality in China's poorer regions. What the rich regions did get in return for paying for all of this, or to be more, more precise, what the elites in the rich regions region got, was a fair degree of autonomy. 
since they were funding their own irrigation, flood control, temple building, granaries, etc., they could manage them as they saw fit and use them to make sure that their families stayed in control of the localities where they lived, while a few of their sons circulated among official compounds all across the empire. The system didn't produce much per capita growth, and by taking resources out of the empire's most advanced region, it may even have worked against a transformative economic breakthrough. But it did provide a reasonable degree of subsistence security, even in the empire's poorer, more ecologically fragile regions, until, until the system cracked under multiple pr pressures in the 19th century. So that's the top-down story. But what was probably even more important was the socioeconomic system that had developed in rural China, partly at least from the bottom up. In particular, I want to focus on the distribution of property rights. To greatly oversimplify, most farmers in China's poorer regions were smallholders. In the most advanced areas, there were far more tenants. But most of those tenants had relative security of tenure. In fact, the right to remain on a farm as a tenant, unless you did something really egregious, had, by Qing times, become a form of property separate from ownership of the subsoil. And it was ownership of the subsoil that gave you the right to collect rent. So that right to remain as a tenant was something that could be sold, mortgaged, or inherited separately from the land itself and it was frequently more valuable. Being hard to evict gave tenants an incentive to take care of the land and maintain its pro productivity, which they generally did, helping to fuel a slow but steady upward creep in average productivity per acre. Being hard to evict, however, also gave them considerable bargaining power, which helped keep rents rising a bit more slowly than yields over the long haul. Right? If the tenant is hard to evict, it's hard to get him to give up the full value of the productivity increase he's achieved. He's going to be able to keep at least a little bit of it for himself. We find the rise in rents lagging further and further behind the rise in output. Consequently, tenants, though to Western eyes they look propertyless, earned far more than wage laborers. In fact, about two and a half times as much, according to estimates using 18th century data from the lower Yangtze and coastal Fujian. And in fact, about the same amount, 2.5 times as much, is what we get using the better data available in the 1920s. Now this is a big reason why, as I mentioned before, real wages in the lower Yangtze could lag far behind those in England and Holland, while popular living standards kept up with those places. In the Delta, only 10 to 15 percent of adults got their main income from wages, while in England and Holland by this time, the figure was about 50 percent. And as just noted, tenant farmers earned vastly more than wage laborers. So a comparison of unskilled wages is a comparison of the middle of the British income distribution with the bottom of the Yangtze Delta income distribution. And in fact, it would be shocking then if British wages weren't much higher. The wages don't reflect the levels at which Yangtze Delta peasants were living. Now consider a few consequences of this for Chinese development. For one, while tenants earned enough to support a family, Landless laborers generally did not. And in a society with a shortage of marriageable women, due to concubinage and sex-selective infanticide, most rural proletarians did not reproduce. In some sense, this stabilized the system, because it kept the ranks of the dispossessed small, despite ongoing commercialization. Right? So competition creates winners and losers, in every generation, some losers fall into the ranks of the, of the wage labor force. But if the last generation of wage laborers largely don't reproduce, the percentage of people in that group that have to rely on wages 
never grows. And in fact, the percentage of people who rely on wages in the countryside stays at about 10% all the way down to 1949. Equally critical, this huge gap between rural wages in the strict sense and the earnings of the vast majority also kept urban laborers' wages low, right? If you're an urban employer, how much are you going to offer for an unskilled worker? You're going to offer just a tiny bit above what they could make in the countryside, right? Because you don't want to pay any more than you have to. As long as you pay a tiny bit more than the countryside, you'll get somebody. What that means is that urban unskilled wages are also way below what tenant farmers make, not to mention what farmers who own their own land make. Consequently, even if you're poorer than the average tenant and you're looking to better yourself, you generally don't head for the cities. In fact, if you're looking to better yourself, you probably head for the frontier where you can claim some land. So one of the things this means is that there was plenty of development of handicraft industry, some of it quite sophisticated, and producing for markets far away. But it, it's handicraft industry that stays in the countryside. So the farm wife, for instance, producing textiles for the market. This was not a kind of industrialization particularly likely to lead to mechanization. Urban concentrations of industry created a much better environment for the exchange of information, important to technical change. Full-time craftspeople were much more likely to invest in upgrading their skills than part-timers who also farmed. And since European cities, unlike Chinese ones, were places where labor cost much more than in the countryside, while capital cost less, industry there had a stronger tendency to gradually become more capital intensive over time. And that tendency didn't really exist in China. Add to that the huge difference in energy costs, and you can begin to see why mechanization was a lot more likely in Europe, even given roughly comparable levels of economic prosperity and market development beforehand. To give just one last, but I think telling, data point, we happen to have remarkably good data on wages and prices in Guangzhou, um, what's sometimes called Canton, in China's second most prosperous region, for the year 1704. So for that one year, we can do a really systematic comparison with Britain. Now, as it turns out, nominal unskilled wages in Guangzhou were only 28% of the London level. But most goods were also vastly cheaper in Guangzhou. And basic starchy food, the main purchase for poor people everywhere, was only 24% of the London level. So that real wages in this year were actually still equal. But there's one big exception to everything being cheaper in Guangzhou. And that's charcoal, which cost 528% of its London price. So what that means is that even with real wages being about the same, heat energy was 20 times as cheap relative to muscle energy in London as it was in Guangzhou. Is it any wonder, then, that in Britain, people were very interested in finding ways to use fuel instead of human or animal muscle, and in China, they weren't? Let me stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Um, there's a lot more that could be said, but I think I've gone on long enough. Thank you. Thank you.